So origami and engineering are not words most people put in one sentence. Whereas for me, it's an obvious combination where you combine two different fields. So let me start with the basics. Origami literally means folding paper. The Japanese words for oru to fold and kami paper. And it's a very big part of Japanese culture and history. Back in the 18th century, you can find documentation of the famous origami crane. In the book, Hiden Senbazuru Origata, or the secret of folding a thousand cranes. And folding a thousand cranes is something that, again, holds significance in Japanese culture. If you fold a thousand cranes, as you see on the right, the gods wish you eternal good luck. Folding a crane, I think many people in this audience will have folded a crane very similar. This is the simple one, but things have moved on a little bit. On the left is again a crane by Robert Lang, who was just mentioned, who's probably the premier origami artist and scientist at the moment. A single piece of paper makes a crane, but he can make anything he puts his mind to, a moose, spiders, and some people can do this from a single piece of paper. Not me. <laughs> this is beautiful. I find this a beautiful art. But as an engineer and as a mathematician, for me, I'm drawn to things like this, where I see math, I see beautiful geometric shapes. And the interesting thing here is the artist, Yun Mitani, he's a computer scientist by day and an origami artist by night. He understands the math, and he can therefore make things like this. And that's kind of the underlying theme for me, at least for origami, is when I look at an origami piece, it's math personified. Because if, it, if you take Robert Lang's crane, and then you look at the fold pattern on the right, well, if I gave you the piece on the right, would you make the thing on the left? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> but Robert essentially was able to take this idea of a, of a bird, and map it through some origami software into the crease pattern on the right, and still takes an artist to go from that crease pattern to the bird. But for me, what I find so fascinating is this underlying math. For me, origami is math visualized. In 3D, math appears. And this always reminded me of a kind of famous uh, interview with um, Richard Feynman, who was a physicist. If you haven't seen this interview, do look it up, I think it's still on BBC. And he, is, he talks about the fascinating kind of physics behind the world around us. And he's asked to talk about a flower. And he has a discussion with an artist friend of his, and the artist says, well, I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. And Feynman gets a bit upset and goes, well, but actually, you can see the outside. As a physicist, you can see why is the flower that color? Why does it attract the insect? What's the photosynthesis? So he was arguing, by knowing more about the physics and the science and the chemistry of a flower, you actually appreciate the beauty more. And for me, that's the case with origami. The more I understand the math and the physics of it, the more beautiful it becomes. But I'm not a scientist by any stretch. I'm an engineer. And there's a famous quote by a very famous engineer, Theodore von Kármán, Scientists study the world as it is. Engineers create the world that has never been. So we take our understanding of maths and physics and do something with that. So this is where kind of my talk, kind of in a way, starts. So how can we take origami as an art form and use it to solve problems? So how can we create solutions using origami? Before I go there, though, I would like you to think a little bit about the world around you and see where you might encounter folding and origami in a natural way around us. And the first example is a piece of paper. If I take a piece of paper, scrunch it up, and unfold it, unfurl it, if you look closely, you see a pattern of fold lines. Physicists have done this. They have taken a piece of paper, scrunched it up, x-rayed it, and looked at the folds inside they got funding somehow. <laughs> I haven't done this. This is Professor Witten's work. Um, this is my folding my bedsheets, which were slightly wrinkled. You see wrinkles, I see fold patterns. I can visualize how this folds. But also you see folding in unusual places. Um, 
millions of people every year flock to Paris to see Mona Lisa smile. Why would you want to do that? Look at the sleeves. <laughs> if you roll up your sleeves, it folds automatically in this beautiful fold pattern. I see mountain folds, valley folds. I see physics happening there. So this is the Mona Lisa. You didn't have to go to Paris to see folding. Just walk outside a few weeks ago. Spring erupted around us. Um, folding leaves. They fall up in buds. They unfurl and grow. It's a folding motion. It's a fold pattern. And engineers have looked at that and taken inspiration. Other sources of inspiration you might encounter uh, around you? Insects. Those wings for the insects, they have to somehow fold up and fit uh, under their... Uh, protective shields. There's a fold pattern there. Nature has come up with a way of packaging that wing in a, such a compact way it fits. And then again, engineers and scientists then reverse engineer that. Here's see an article published in Science a few years ago where they came up with a way of describing how this works. Really fascinating work. I talk for hours about this, but I, I shan't. <laughs> What I want you to take away from this bit is that folding is something that's natural, it's around us, and we can take inspiration from that. Which brings me then to origami-inspired engineering. So we want to use origami patterns to solve engineering problems. And there's a huge host of areas in which we're trying to uh, apply this. And I don't have the time to go in huge amounts of detail, but to give you a flavor, Using origami, we can make, make materials that behave in very unusual ways, that are stiff in one direction, compliant in another direction. We can make self-folding robots. You see pictures there of a little robot that's flat. You press the button, it folds up, and then walks off. Magic. We can do that at different scales. There's a little picture of a crane there. You can't really see the scale there, but that little crane is less than the thickness of a penny coin. So we can fold a crane at that scale. And actually, we can do this small. This is old work. So we can do design the materials. We can do transformers. But the thing that actually appeals most to people like myself, aerospace engineers, is deployables, things that start small and then unfurl to be large. And I'm going to illustrate that with a very classic fold pattern, which the joy of doing origami is you can take your props with you <laughs> in your back pocket. This is a very classic origami pattern, and it kind of typifies lots of reasons why we want to use it. This is called the Mura Ori, and it's named after Professor Mura, who I happened to meet about 10 years ago. And he kind of came up with this pattern, well, when I say came up, he discovered it. It was around us. This folding is the Mura Ori. But he described this about in the 60s, and he described the math of this, and it's essentially a very simple pattern. Engineers like simple things. It's the same repeating thing over and over again, but it has really interesting properties, and it's sometimes called the hydrogen atom of origami, because it's really simple, but imbued with really interesting properties. So take this, starts as a flat sheet, folds up really compactly, and you can easily deploy and unfurl. And lots of things you can do with this. My entire PhD was essentially describing that. <laughs> three years of my life <laughs> describing <laughs> that. Good three years, but uh, niche. <laughs> <laughs> the picture you see at the top is also one of my PhD pictures. I, really, I, I can close my eyes and I, I see this pattern everywhere. But Professor Muir also used it for engineering applications. He proposed this pattern for a range of applications. One of them was a spacecraft. And this was launched um, about two, three decades ago. And there were solar panels. They packaged up solar panels in a compact way for launch, deployed them in orbit. Because the bigger your solar array is, the more power you generate, and the better you can power your satellite. As I mentioned, Mona Lisa was a few centuries ahead of Professor Mura in that fold pattern. I hope you see the similarity in the patterns there. So as an aerospace engineer, I am intrigued by the applications of origami for, for space applications. So I'm going to take you through a selection of a few applications I've come across 
where origami is used for, for, for space. And it's a whistle-stop tour. Whistle -stop tour. I, can, I can come up with many, many more. This is a fold pattern that was kind of described by actually my PhD supervisor, Professor Guest, back in the 90s. And the modification of that has been used for this deployable structure. This is, these are real people, that's to scale. <laughs> that folds up into a really tight bundle. And NASA has been working on this as a concept for what's called a star shade. It will be part of a uh, telescope, and they would unfurl this to kind of block light coming into the telescope. So it, it occludes the light that they don't need, and so you can focus on the thing you want to. It's a marvelous bit of technology. Um, if you're wondering what all those little wires are for, it's basically suspended from the ceiling to, to make it act as if it's in, in space, zero gravity. It's a huge kind of project from NASA, NASA JPL, um, but it's based on this kind of fold pattern, which keeps coming back in space applications. So another application of this same fold pattern is a company out in Cardiff. Who knew space in Cardiff? <laughs> they are trying to build reusable satellites. I think you all got used to the idea of rockets being re reused. SpaceX has made it obvious that a rocket can land. This was mind-boggling 10 years ago that a rocket could land. But now rockets land. But we can't reuse satellites yet, because as they come down from orbit, they burn up. This company is using an origami pattern to deploy in front of the satellite as it comes down from, the from, from space through the atmosphere to the ground. So the origami pattern unfurls, provides a heat shield, and is also a parachute to slow down the uh, satellite. So the same origami pattern, and you can see hopefully why, that why we do this. It has to be small, can't get in the way of the satellite once in orbit, but you need something very large once you're coming down. So this is kind of deep space around, uh, around, uh, around the Earth in orbit. Other applications people have thought about and worked on is a origami space habitat. So this is not on the moon. <laughs> this is Greenland. Uh, this is because the architects who worked on this are uh, Danish, and they spend several months uh, tucked away in this origami module on Greenland. Again, experience what it would be like to, to live on the moon in an origami uh, habitat. In the middle, you see it from stowed to deployed. Um, the little box at the top is a uh, shipping container. When you go to orbit, you use a rocket fairing. <laughs> Going to Greenland requires a shipping container. So it had to fit in the shipping container, but had to unfurl to this large size. And this is a kind of, again, a pattern derived from a Professor Muir's pattern. So you can see how something like that, so this is almost identical pattern, can unfurl and stow very compactly. So we've got an example of things in orbit, perhaps on the moon, but we might even use origami to go to the stars. Because one of the concepts that people use for interplanetary travel, actually interstellar travel, is the idea of solar sails. And here you need a very, very large membrane in space, where it's literally the light, the force exerted by the light that pushes your spacecraft along. So this is tiny amounts of force, but if you apply it continuously, the spacecraft will travel at high speeds through, through space. And you see an origami pattern to package that. So what I've shown you here is a number of examples where origami has, insp has inspired mathematicians, scientists, and engineers. We use it to come up with novel solutions. And I want you to look around yourself. Are there kind of unexpected sources of inspiration? Because origami and engineering are not obvious uh, combinations, so it's unexpected. Look for these sources. And look beyond the obvious, because as I said before, people look at Mona Lisa and they see their smile. Look elsewhere, look at her sleeves, which is much more beautiful. So I'll leave you there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that. It was uh, genuinely fascinating, um, and um, I love 
uh, one of the things I love is, 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 is your ability to see things that are, in a sense, hidden in plain sight. Yes. Yeah. And I guess, Michael, so, so how, did you, how did you come upon origami? What began your fascination with the topic? I think fascination might be... Or interest. It, not that I'm trying to paint a picture here. So for me, origami was a natural thing in childhood. My mum does a lot of origami. And yeah. It's something I did as a child. An obvious thing to do as a uh -huh. pastime. Mm -hmm. Then there was a big gap from being about 10 to when I was studying my PhD in early 20s. And I hadn't really thought about using origami. Okay. But my, my PhD supervisor had done deployable structures. I was like, OK. Welcome, welcome to Cambridge, welcome to your PhD. Um, what would you like to work on? Okay, I have to decide. <laughs> so I ended up looking around for about a month or so for interesting topics, mm. and I came across some of his work, and I saw origami, like, well, yeah, that'd be fun. Mm -hmm. And that was it. <laughs> right? I've never okay. looked back. So yeah. there was no deep, hidden passion there. It was just yeah. a connection back to what I knew, and I find the maths and physics fascinating. Go no, no, no. Well, well, thank you. And <laughs> like, but I. So the the other question for me is: that is is this something that you're expecting to see more and more of in terms of, you know, if you will, uh, engineering taking some inspiration from 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 this area? Well, engineers taking inspiration from unusual sources it has been around for a while. A lot sure. of biomimicry, people looking at nature to take inspiration. I think origami is one of the few examples where it's worked both ways. You couldn't design the things that Robert Lang does without understanding the math. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't have done the math if you hadn't seen the art before. Mm -hmm. So one of the few occasions where it really has been a back and forth, mm -hmm. the understanding of the math has spurred along the art, and the artist kind of pushed along the, the science, the engineering. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what makes origami unique in that way, that mm -hmm. we kind of have that back and forth between the two. Two areas. And so are they, is, is origami something that continues to evolve? Are people still discovering new things to, to, uh, to Absol fold? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, the Murari, the pattern I showed, we keep coming back to it. It keeps revealing new, new yeah. things. Um, but yeah, the field has exploded. When I did my PhD, it was a small-ish <laughs> field. Now I can't even keep up with the publications uh, in the area. So it keeps right. evolving. It keeps, keeps growing. Cool. All right. Mark, thank you so much. My Cheers. pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you.